Hello, and welcome to the Demi Plane of Gaming. I am your host, Stephen D. Russell. I am here, as always, with my co-host, Owen K.C. Stevens. Hi, folks. Uh, we're also here today with uh, our special guest, Dave Gross. We want to thank Dave for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Okay. And we're going to be talking about novels today, which is a little bit different, different for the Demi Plane of Gaming. But Dave does a lot of novels that are related to gaming. And, of course, Dave has a very long history related to the... Uh, gaming industry, and I'll let Owen take over that part because he he has known Dave longer <laughs> than I. Well, so. Dave got me my very first paying uh, game writing gig back when he was the editor of Dragon Magazine in the 90s. What um, year was that? Do you remember? What? What year was that? Do you remember? Well, I know it was issue 251 because it was yep. the, the very first issue that wasn't in the uh, electronic compilation set that came out later. Uh, so it would have been like 97, 96, right around that there. That sounds right. Probably yeah, 97. It was, it was uh, by any other name, The Elves. Wasn't that your first one? Owen? That was the first That was the first one that was published. Um, okay. It wasn't actually the first one he bought, which was kind of funny. But uh, nor was it the first thing I pitched. And and the, the way this all worked is I, I, I sent in a pitch article. And back then, you typed it, right? And you sent it by mail. And then you waited with bated breath for the editor to have written a response and to mail it back to you. Uh, and he did, and he said, you know, we just did our annual dwarf article, and I'm like, I'm an idiot, I should have known that. Uh, but we could really use an elf name generator if you can get one to us in about 30 days. And I was like, <clears throat> I was all excited, because I'd never had anything published before <laughs> professionally. Um, and so I sat down and I wrote an elf name generator, and then when that got accepted, uh, Dave sent me his email, and suddenly I didn't have to mail in requests anymore, and... That that started that, and I've been doing it ever since. So like 16, 17 years now. Good times. Uh, so that's that's how I got my start, which was Dave Gross gave me my start in gaming. What I'm curious about and have never asked about is Dave, how did you end up as editor of Dragon Magazine, and what was your introduction into the the gaming culture in general? Wow. Um, let me take those in two parts because they're sure. very far apart. I started gaming when I was in about seventh grade. A friend at the new school that I just moved to, his name is Jeff Tucker, introduced me to the game along with his older brother, Mike Tucker. And they taught me how to play D&D from the little pamphlets. But it was right around the time that the... Uh, that the the original blue basic box and the uh, hardcovers were becoming popular, so I asked for those for Christmas, absorbed them immediately, and within two months I wasn't a player anymore. I was DMing. And I was just a hardcore D&D player, like most of us, when I was in my teenage years. So that's how I got involved with gaming. There are a lot of little incremental steps in between, but the second time I applied for the job, a job at TSR, um, I had been told by a friend that Polyhedron Newsine was looking for a new editor because Skip Williams was transferring over to R&D. And I made it an application via email and got a hold of uh, Gene Raby, who was the head of the RPG at that time. And it took weeks and weeks to find out whether I had gotten the job. And unfortunately, I had just about enough money because I was teaching college-level English and was making no money at all. I had either enough money to go to Gen Con that year or to move to... Wisconsin and take this job. And so I decided not to go to Gen Con in hopes that I would get this job. And uh, they, the day after they got back from Gen Con, the vice president whose approval she needed to hire me said yes. And I was so frustrated because if he had said yes two weeks earlier, I would have gone to Gen Con for free or yep. you know, on the company's dime. Right. But not, so I, I actually <laughs> missed the, uh, Gen Con the year that I was hired at TSR. And then the short story is that I worked... Uh, polyhedron newsing for a little while and then the third time that or this I should say the second time that I applied for the job of Dragon magazine um, Wolfgang Bauer got it because he'd been working on uh, Dungeon Adventures and I thought okay that's fair Wolf's got the experience and my consolation prize was that instead of getting the Dragon job I replaced Wolf at Dungeon and so we were a happy family for about four months at which point Wolf left Dragon uh, to work for Wizards of the Coast for about a year before the takeover. Not that I think he knew anything about that in advance. It just worked out that way. And so at that point, I applied for the uh, Dragon job for the third time, 
and uh, the day that I would have been interviewed for the job, that I actually was interviewed for the job, a new fellow had just joined R&D and had a very impressive resume. The owner of the company saw his resume on the fax machine and said to the publisher of the magazines, you better, um, you better interview this guy. And apparently she said it in a certain way. And so we both got very brief interviews with a metaphor, a, a wonderful metaphor that I will not tell you on this podcast, but I'll tell you sometime when we're having beers at a convention. He asked me a metaphorical question that was very difficult for me to answer. And I answered it, and he said, go back to your desk, and in 15 minutes I'll call you and let you know whether you've had the job. And I got back five minutes later, and I got the call, you don't have the job because you answered the wrong metaphor. But then about a year later, um, things changed again, and... Uh, the fellow who did get the job at Dragon Magazine moved over to Dungeon, and I was moved over to Dragon. And so when I finally did get the Dragon job, it wasn't because I had applied for it. It was because there was a shuffle in the staff. So you never got it based on your application? I never got it legitimately. The very first time I applied for it, it was my own damn fault. I asked the secretary at the university where I was teaching to type the envelope for me because she was very nice. I, I was a terrible typist. And she did this, and I... Just as I dropped it in the mailbox, I saw that instead of James M. Ward, the envelope read James W. Ward. And rather than going back and asking somebody to get a key to get that letter out of the mailbox and retyping it, I let it go. And ever since then, I've thought, Jim saw that envelope and said, well, this guy's clearly not an editor, <laughs> and threw it in the bin. <laughs> you know, it's funny you talk about typing. The, the first article I did for you, the... the, the Oh, there was another one that came before the Yelp that, that you bought. I don't actually remember what it was, but I hand wrote it on notebooks, and my wife typed it up. Oh, and, nice. and and you bought it, and as soon as that check arrived, as soon as I had a check, she said, "Okay, I'm never typing up one of your articles again. <laughs> so you have to learn how to type." And I literally did not know how to type. Wow. Um, and so I I self taught myself to type in order to keep doing dragon articles. I wish you had told me that at the time, because in the 90s, there was a great way to learn how to type. It was called Typing of the Dead. On your, uh, I can't remember if it was Sega or something else, there was House of the Dead, uh, the video game. But instead of shooting with a pistol, you uh -huh. had to type words that appeared on the screen to kill the zombie. I, I, I had a very more, more had a similar program the game than anything else. There was a uh, uh, typing Sherlock Holmes mystery type program. So you would have to properly type, and you would get a number of clues based on how well you did and how fast, etc. So I, in fact, used our, our at the time, brand new, and now I'm sure so archaic it probably couldn't run an, an app on an iPhone, uh, computer to, to self-type. But the, one of the th results of that was I do not do proper typing, right? I type with six fingers, mostly oh. five. Um, it's so nice to be able to learn to type with all of your fingers. It makes things much faster and easier. I, you know, I can do 100 words a minute the way I'm doing it. I, That's I pretty good. I, I think I'm doing okay. Um, and honestly, I, I rarely think of things at 100 words a minute, so I'm not sure I need to type any faster. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty much that's, you know, I was trained to professionally type, and I can do uh, pretty pretty well, but most of the time I'm typing as I I think or... Uh -huh. uh, where I just as as the the words come to me, I'm typing that typing them, and then I have to go back and re-edit it anyway. So, uh, so then I'm up, get the idea. For, I'm up on your career for a while, Dave, because you've got you've got Dragon, and then you were also like assistant editor on Dungeon, and then you did Star Wars Gamer. Um, and uh, I specifically remember with Star Wars Gamer, you you came down. I was actually working at Wizards of the Coast at the time, and you had some oh, Starship right. art that. Uh, who was it? Was Jeff Carlyle that did those? Um, who? And he said, "Hey, would you the 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 article in the Starship that I wrote for you for Star Wars Gamer was that?" Yes, but what was the name you said? Was it Jeff Carlyle? It could very well have been. Jeff did some great art for us. I, I think it was. And and Dave shows up and he says, "Hey, Owen, would you like to write up some some background histories for these starships and some game right. stats?" And this is the sort of thing I would do in my spare time. So I'm like, yes, I'd love to do that. He's like, "Great, I'll go write up a contract." I was like, "What? What do you mean a contract? I work for Wizards of the Coast." He's like, "No, no, no." This is for the magazine stuff. We still pay. Did no one tell you we pay you separately for the magazines? And I was like, no. And so, because so, I hadn't been doing anything for the magazines, because I, I was busy with my other stuff. So suddenly I was writing for the magazines again, because that all paid separately. Um, but what was your first novel? My first full length novel that was published was Fair. Black Wolf. 
for uh, the Sembia series, which I believe came out in 2000, so I probably wrote it in 1999 or thereabouts. Uh-huh. Uh, the first half a novel that I wrote for TSR was a, an unpublished Ravenloft novel. Aww. And as I got about halfway through it, um, I was asked to write or to pitch a story for a Ravenloft anthology, which also never came out. And I got excited. I, I, I wrote the story that weekend, and I sent it over to my editor, who acted a little funny that I'd turned it over so early. And he, he, was, he was just a little twitchy, and he kept talking to me as if he wanted to say something to me but couldn't. And I guess his conscience got the better of him because later that week he had a talk with his boss and got special permission to tell me, Dave, we're canceling the Ravenloft line. It's nothing to do with you. Nobody's seen your novel. Nobody has any opinion about it one way or the other. It's just that we've decided that Ravenloft has come to an end as a novel line. And uh, so what we'd like you to do is to finish that novel and we'll pay you a kill fee, a fraction of the money we would have paid you. Uh-huh. And then maybe we'll ask you to rewrite it and set it in a different setting. The Forgotten Realms, which was a terrible thing for me because I had chosen a portion of Ravenloft which was completely unlike the realms. It was more like Revolutionary War era United States. Uh-huh. And it was mm. nothing that you could convert to the Forgotten Realms. And so I, I said to the uh, then publisher of the book department, please don't give me a kill fee. I don't want to finish this novel because it's not going to be something that we can convert easily. Let me have a shot at a Forgotten Realms novel instead. Because I'd actually pitched two novels at the same time, one set in the realms and one set in Ravenloft. And they had originally told me, we liked both of your pitches, but everybody pitched for the Forgotten Realms. Forgotten Realms. And yours was one of the few Ravenloft pitches that we liked. And so I went down that dark path, which ended abruptly with a a sudden (laughs) sharp blow to the back of the head. But what was nice about that was um, instead of uh, rewriting that novel, I got first, second choice, I should say. Greenwood got first choice. I got second choice of the characters that they wanted us to develop for the Sembia series. And when I saw that one of the characters was secretly a werewolf, that's the one I picked. There you go. So, cool. Which lets you merge a little bit of Raven Lofty horror into... Well, you're right. I hadn't thought of it in those terms before, but you're absolutely right. That did get to yeah. be a slightly Raven Lofty novel. <laughs> I suspect most of the people who are actually going to watch this show now uh, know you best for your Pathfinder novels, although I could be mistaken about that. Well, but you've got a line of very, very popular Pathfinder novels. I just realized um, a couple of weeks ago that I've written about a half a million words of Pathfinder fiction, um, and it accounts for somewhere between 30 and 40% of all of the fiction that I've had published in just the last few years. I, I just... When I was writing in the early 2000s, I also had a full-time job. And so I was lucky if I could do a book every other year. And these days, right. um, either I've been working part-time or working uh, short contract gigs, and then I've had a lot of free time in between. Or like this year, I've gone completely dedicated to prose fiction. I stay at home and I write all day. Yeah. So I've been more prolific than usual. And so it's not it's not surprising that people would think of me as the Pathfinder guy, even though 60% of my work is other stuff. So how did you get started writing for the Pathfinder novels? In 2008, I saw that the World Fantasy Convention was in Calgary, Alberta, which is just a three-hour drive south of here. And I knew that some friends, Pierce Waters and Eric Mona, and a couple of other, well, more than a couple, lots of other people that I hadn't seen in years because I hadn't been doing the convention circuit would be there. So I went down just as a social thing. And then one day, Eric and I and a few others are having a drink in a bar, and he leans over and he says, by the way, we're thinking of starting a fiction line. And I remember that you had written some novels for The Forgotten Realms. And later I hear through Pierce that they had done some uh, research on which of The Forgotten Realms books around that period had sold reasonably well. And one of mine had done reasonably well. And so they were hoping Black Wolf did well. Um, the, the later one of the, the sequel, Lord of Stormweather, not really a sequel, but a later book in the same series, because it was the very last book in a series, it didn't do as well, because when you have a series, the first book yeah. always does the best, and then everything afterward struggles to, to reach some large fraction of that first book's success. But uh, both of them did all right. It's just that Black Wolf did a lot better. But at that point, they didn't have a clear plan in place. They knew they wanted to do it, but they were still working out the details. And so... Uh, Eric passed me along to James Sutter, the fiction editor over at 
Paizo. I think he's actually the senior editor now, although he's responsible for all of the fiction and also for some other game products. But he gave me a, an email and said, uh, how would you like to write a serial novella for us for one of the uh, adventure paths? And I did. I was already a fan of... Uh, Pathfinder, because some friends had turned me on to the Adventure Paths just a year earlier, and the Adventure Path was uh, the Council of Thieves set in Chelyax. So I pitched him four or five different ideas. Actually, I think I pitched him one or two in the beginning, and he said, give me more. Give me a lot of choice. And one of the ones that I offered him when he asked for more was a pitch I had originally made for another setting for another large game publisher, whose editor... Um, asked me for a pitch, and then didn't respond for eight months. And then when I finally got back in touch with him, he didn't want that particular story, but he wanted me to pitch again. But he didn't give me any more detail, and he didn't respond to my email asking for more detail. And then three months later, he had left the company. So something was going on there. But uh, I had this pitch that I made for another setting, and I reworked it to fit Galarian, uh, the world of Pathfinder, and that's the one that James liked best. So I adapted a little bit further. He gave me one really great piece of advice. He said, you have this half-orc bodyguard, but we've got this other half-orc character coming up. And in Chelyax, the people who are mistreated the way that half-orcs are everywhere are, well, we don't use this, this word anymore, but he said they're tieflings. They are what we now call hellspawn in Pathfinder Tales. Why don't you make your character a hellspawn? And so I did, and that's how this half-orc bodyguard Instead, became Radovan, uh, Count Jigar's now partner, but previous bodyguard. That's that's basically how it happened. He liked the story. He liked the uh, novella that I wrote, and he said, "Pitch me a novel with the same characters." And so I did. I pitched again three, four, five ideas, and the one that he liked best was the one set in Ustalov. And so I was scheduled to write the second Pathfinder novel. Um, I think it had a different title a couple of times. Eventually the title became Prince of Wolves, and it was scheduled to come out in October of that year. But that was also a year in which uh, my friend Elaine Cunningham was having an awful lot of personal issues. Her, her sister was dreadfully sick. Her mother was also very ill. Lots of family stuff. And so while her novel was originally scheduled to be first, it needed to be moved back to the October slot, which meant mine got moved up to the August slot, which meant the month of revisions I thought I was going to have became the two days of revision that I got. So that was a novel that I wrote in a very short period of time, and then there was, there was very little lingering on it after it was done. But the great news was that not only did they get it out in time for August, but they printed good quality... Um, the, the, the word is coming right out of my head now. Advanced copies, proofs. Yes, really proofs, yeah. Uh, for, for May of that year, and they gave them away at the uh, EA in New York, okay. uh -huh. uh, the Book Expo, Book Expo of America. And one of the people who was there who got the book is a fellow named Mordecai Knode who writes for Tor.com on the side. He has a day job in publishing as well. And he loved the book and said very nice things about it. So the very first review that came out for the book was very positive, and that started a good wave of publicity for, for the whole line. I, uh, I actually have one of those advanced copies. I was undergoing some, some surgery back when those were first coming out, and the Paizo people knew that because I had had to decline a project. Right. And they actually were kind enough to give me a care package that included uh, some of their map packs and just some of the stuff in the back and the advanced copy of that. So I was sitting there... I, I only vaguely remember this novel because I was on post surgical painkillers while I read most of it. But but it did it was it was a an interesting read and I enjoyed it and and I, I thought I thought it was an excellent standard to set because fiction set in RPG worlds don't have the best reputation in the world. Um, and I think that that all the novels that have come out from that and, and especially the, the uh, Radovan and, and Count characters that you've done have, have been had a very high level of quality, and I think that's helped establish Pathfinder novels as perhaps not being the same as, and I will just say some other because I don't want to <laughs> I don't want to call anyone out, but you know there have been periods where printing game based novels was was a question of how many could I print and how many could we get out rather than how good are, how good's the writing. Well, I think a lot of the credit belongs to the editor James Sutter for picking the people that he's picked. Uh, I'm very proud not only of the books that I've been involved with, but the, of the line as a whole, I think, stands up very well 
compared to other tie-in fiction. And I think part of it is the decision to make this a little bit more realistic, a little, realistic is the wrong word to use, a little bit more sword and sorcery, a little bit less, less epic fantasy, uh -huh. a little bit more for adults, a little bit less for teenagers, for young teenagers. Um, those choices and the sensibilities of not just James, but also of Eric and the other people involved with the fiction line at Paizo are a little bit more um, Fritz Leiber and a little bit less uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Not that there's anything wrong with Tolkien. I think he's great. No. But we've had an awful lot of that over the last 40 years since um, it, Tolkien imitators became so popular in the late 70s and yeah. ever since. We actually have a question that kind of ties in, into that from one, from one of our... Uh, Robert, Robert Emerson uh, chimed in and was, uh, as they are often compared to the erstwhile Fard and the Grey Mauser, uh, what was the main inspiration for Jaeger and Radovan's dynamic? Is there one, or is it more a stew of various inspirations? It's definitely a stew. There's a hundred influences, and sometimes there are influences that I don't know that that I'm not aware of until three years later. Say somebody yeah. will tell me, "Hey, this reminds me a lot of thus and such," and I'll realize, "Yes, I love that thing." No, it had to have been in my mind when I was writing this. Mm -hmm. But the pitch, when you pitch a story or you pitch a couple of characters to an editor, and you're pitching five or six different things at once, you use a little bit of a shorthand. In Hollywood, they call it the elevator pitch. What would you say to the producer if you were on the elevator together for three floors? And so my, my pitch for them was basically Magical Holmes and Watson, which makes more sense for the first story that I wrote. Uh -huh. It doesn't really encapsulate what they are throughout the whole series of stories and novels. So Holmes and Watson is a good starting point for them, but Count Chaguer is not really like Holmes because he's an aristocrat. He's much more emotional. He's got a bigger personal life than Holmes ever had, and he's, frankly, not as smart as Holmes. So the, also, the he's comparison breaks down. He's snooty as well. Pardon? He's also surprisingly snooty. Yes, yeah, he's absolutely snooty because part of, the, part of the point of the stories is I like to go high and low. I like to show the aristocrat, and I like to show the guy who lived on the streets and show where their sensibilities intersect and where they don't. There are things that the boys have in common, lots of things, but there are some things that they will never have in common because they grew up in such different circumstances. I love film. Uh, I'm a big movie nerd, not just genre films, but all kinds of movies. One of my favorites is a French film called The Rules of the Game, and it's about, once again, the high and low opinions of people just before World War II in France and how the aristocracy th see things differently than the... the common folk do. And that was, I don't know that it was ever an influence directly on Count Chaguer and Radovan, but it's one of the pictures that makes me remember just how clearly uh, there is a difference in class in most places in the world. We don't think of ourselves as having class differences in North America, but we absolutely do. It's just whether you're filthy rich or whether you're getting by paycheck to paycheck. That's our class difference there. In the UK, people talk about class as being a function of birth. I was born in the nobility, or I was born on this street of row houses in a, in a little town outside of London. Uh, but the, 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 the difference exists in every culture. There are the haves and the have, have nots. And that's a part of what Radovan and Jaguar are all about. One has always had what he wants from birth, and one has not. And these days, the characters are so close together because of their shared experiences that we don't always see the differences in their background in the in the novels, but we definitely see them in the short stories and in, in the flashbacks of their previous lives. Well, there's there's even a wonderful moment about that closeness in, uh, I think, Queen of Thrones, where the the Count says, Radovan, you know, with everything we've been through, you can use my first name. And Radovan responds, I know I could. And the Count just nods, okay, he knows, but he chooses not to, and on he goes. And it's, right. it's a lovely moment that both defines how the relationship has changed and how they approach that from different places based on, on their different backgrounds and attitudes. You just reminded me. I think I know where that comes from. There was a moment in college when I was very friendly with the professor. He taught heroic literature. A lot of the stuff that he uh, was interested in crossed over between my interest in literature and uh, genre stuff. And one day I just turned to him and I said, could I call you Larry? because that was his first name. And he said, sure. 
and I could never call him Larry. <laughs> I always called him, you know, Doctor, and now I can't say his last name. Um, but now you can call him Larry. In my heart, he's Larry. <laughs> so when you were writing these these books, and, and not just these, but any any game, any fiction set in a setting that that originated as a game setting. How much do you keep in mind the awareness of what the rules will and won't allow characters to do, and how does it modify what you have them do, if at all? Uh, I want to pull a number out of my ear and say it's 90%. I want it to feel like it belongs in this setting. Uh, the, I want to not just obey, but embrace the rules. I want to make the rules work as... You can't even use the word metaphor when you're talking about fantasy because fantasy makes metaphor literal. But I want possible to reveal or rub up against personality and conflict. And if I can do that with uh, some of the rules, I do. But sometimes I want to show how a character or a situation is different. It's an anomaly. I mean, if you're if you're trying to unravel a mystery or if you're trying to search out some strange object on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., you're interested in it because it's different from everything else. It's exceptional. And so sometimes I will either use the rules in an unusual way or, with the permission of the developers, bend the rules a little bit to show that a character or a creature or a situation is different from what everybody already knows works in that world. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of DMs do this too. Your characters know the rule books back and forth, and you want to surprise them with something. So you create something new to surprise them with. And by the time they figure out how it works, the logic of the new thing fits in with the overall logic of the world, but it just hadn't been written down in rules before. Um, one of the things that I always try to ask people when we're talking about stuff through the Pathways magazine, but I don't get the chance to do that with someone like Dave, because we're t oftentimes talking about novels rather than uh, game design. Is do you have a favorite piece of work that you've done that you always like to tell everybody about? Is there something that you really want people to check out about your work? I mean, is there like if it's, it's a lot of people, it's their most recent work. It's like please go, go buy, go buy this um, and check it out because you're promoting it and so forth. And I we, we have that section at the end for you, so don't worry about that. <laughs> But uh, do you have a, a, a piece of work that you're really proud of that you'd like everybody to at least know that's out there and that they should definitely check it out if they enjoy your other works? I think um, some of my Pathfinder books in particular are more popular than the others. Mm -hmm. I think that um, Prince of Wolves and Queen of Thorns tend to be the more popular ones, maybe because they are set in more iconic locations. Uh, Ustalov and the gothic supernatural environment there is it's, it's in everybody's brain from the first moment that they see Frankenstein on television. Um, likewise with Queen of Thorns. Anybody who's ever read Tolkien or any epic fantasy has been in that environment, feels familiar and comfortable there. One that I wish more people would comment on online and would, would embrace or at least try is Master of Devils which is my love letter to Kung Fu movies. Um, <laughs> which I have a signed copy of and I'm very pr proud of because I oh. was doing I was doing Jade Oath at the time. The heroes right, of Jade right. Oath at the time and Dave was like, oh yes, here. here. This is for you. <laughs> yes. um, I think that readers in North America often overlook uh, fantasy from other cultures. Or sometimes they might look at it and think, oh, it's it's a ninja movie or it's, uh, it's a Kung Fu movie. I, I don't like that stuff. But the Cinema, especially, and Master of Devils is more influenced by movies than anything that I've ever written. The cinema of uh, China and Hong Kong is so rich in fantasy and action and all the stuff that we love that I can't believe that subtitles prevent people from enjoying it. There's some great fantasy films, even today, coming out all the time from the, mm -hmm. well, really, from the 40s and 50s till today, but uh, most notably from the 70s through the 90s. Uh, lots of great fantasy films that we all should be embracing. All we got to do to enjoy them is learn to enjoy subtitles. And Master of Devils is my attempt to give you all of that magic without subtitles because you're reading a book that's yeah. written in English. Um, we, have, we have another uh, following question. Shoot. This, one, this one from Stan Brown. Hey. <laughs> hey Stan. 
<laughs> so in your head, do you know what level your characters are? Do you ever think about actually statting them up? Any character who ever casts a spell in one of my books has a character sheet. Uh, because as I'm writing battle scenes, I've got to know when they run out. I've got to know when the ammo is gone. But also I need to think about, before the, the battle scene occurs, what would be an interesting course of battle? What's a great choice for the wizard to make at this moment? What can the, the oracle do to counter this situation? I, I sit down and I think about those character sheets before I construct a battle scene. With the, uh, with the martial characters, less so. I want to know what their, uh, what their feats are. So, for example... In, uh, in Prince of Wolves. I think for the first time I show that Radovan has a special talent. He likes to catch knives and then throw them back at the people who threw them at him. And the moment I thought of that, I thought, I better make sure he can actually do that in the game. And as it turned out, he could. He just had to be maybe a level higher than I was thinking that he was. And so I gave him a level. I granted him a, a story bonus immediately. And so he could do that, that feat. So yes, absolutely. If the character's cast spells 100% of the time. I've, I've worked out a, a level and a, and a spell list. If they don't cast spells, it's maybe. Um, if, if they can do something spectacular with feats, I've already figured out about what level they need to be, but I may not have statted them out. Mm -hmm. How much... Sort of rela relating to that, one of the things I found interesting about these novels, and it may in part be because of, of how they came about, is that unlike a lot of series of novels, the novels themselves, for the most part, aren't about this huge story arc that is alluded to at the beginning, right? There are story arcs that go through all the novels, and, and some of them, you know, as you go, the, the, the mysteries of, like, Radovan's connection to, to his infernal parentage and such get deeper and deeper, and, and you learn more about them. But in many ways, they read like a really awesome RPG campaign, except that RPG <laughs> campaigns tend to make terrible novels. But mm. there's sort of a sense of we do this adventure and we get this level and we sometimes you pick up this specific nifty magic item and then you move on to the next story, which is largely unconnected even though the characters are very much the same. How much did you have an arc for what you wanted to do with multiple novels uh, out ahead of time and, and is that arc largely over with your most recent novel? I don't usually think about the story of future novels, but I okay. do think about the history of the characters and some challenges I would like them to face in the future and secrets I would like to be revealed about their characters in the future. And in most of the novels, there comes a point at which I look back on the character's past, and I'll, I'll drop a little description that seems relevant to what's happening right now, but in my mind, really, I'm thinking, oh, there's another story behind that, and one day I will reveal it, and it will allow me to do this with the character, allow me to put him against this type of foe that I would like him to have to face one day, or it will break him in this interesting way that I would like him to be broken. I don't think of it ever, although maybe I should, I don't ever think of it as, a, as an RPG campaign, but I almost always do think of it as a TV series. And every novel is an episode of the TV series. But I've already had, uh, sometimes with James and sometimes just in my own head, I've had that writer's meeting about the season um, early in the year. And we've already written down on the whiteboard a bunch of things that we would like to have happen one day. And the trick is that if I drop a clue that I want to resolve later, don't make it so enticing that people are going to be frustrated if it's not resolved by the end of the novel but make it memorable enough that when it comes back a book or two later, people will say, oh, I remember he said something about that once before. Now it all makes sense. So the trick is to make myself look a lot smarter than I actually am by laying pipe that one day I will, I will be able to, to, to connect to the upstairs bathroom. Nice. I, I strongly suspect that's another reason why people get a different vibe from this than the epic fantasy vibe, right? Because a lot... Not all, by any means, but a lot of people that are trying to do epic fantasy that are inspired by Tolkien are like, okay, so I've, I've got to introduce the ring in the very first story, and they have to throw it in Mount Doom in the last story, right. and that makes that entire epic fantasy series about the journey of the ring as much as it is about anything else. And and the Fawford and the Grey Mouser and a lot of the other sort of more sword and sorcery stories often were almost entirely episodic. Um, you, you do a, a short story or a novel or a, or a novella, and it's about those characters in that situation, that may or may not refer to anything that ever happened before, then you, you do it next one next time. And so that 
Right. That framing device, I suspect, comes out feeling different because you're thinking of it differently. Yes. Every time I approach one of the novels, or a short story or a novella, the story of that story is its own thing, and it's going to conclude. It's going to have an ending. I'm not going to leave you on a cliffhanger. But the story of the characters does not end. They, 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 they will have other adventures in the future. And I just want to make sure that by the time we get there, there are connections in the present that we can hang the future on. Um, two things. Uh, one, we have another question from Stan Brown, and this comes back to the Master Who's of Devils. Stan guy? He's talking. Uh, Stan is a fellow <laughs> lover of Asian cinema, so and he, he's and he's, ask, he's asking a helpful question here to try to get pe more people to like Master of Devils. Um, what Asian Hong Kong movies would you suggest to help people first getting into the genre? That being, we'll see if a you search on Dave Gross and Kung Fu movie, you can find about six or eight articles that I've written on this very subject. But I will also answer your question. Uh, that my, my choices change from day to day because there are so many different movies um, out there. I saw, by the way, while I, was, while I was preparing Master of Devils and while I was writing it, I watched or re-watched 80 Kung Fu movies. And then I couldn't stop. So by the time I was actually done watching movies related to Master of Devils, I think I'd seen 140 movies, many of which were new to me. I've seen many in the past, but an awful lot I'd, I'd picked up just recently. Um, very recently, I saw a pretty darn good, fairly current film called, um, called Painted Skin. It's a Chinese fantasy. The story is okay. The characters are wonderful. The action scenes are pretty good, but it has actual magic in it. There's a demon who has taken human flesh, and the, the title, Painted Skin, means that she puts human flesh on her demon body to appear as this beautiful woman, and she becomes the other woman in a, in a relationship with the man who rescued her from bandits, rescued her, and uh, his wife, who's played by my Chinese girlfriend, Zhao Wei, who's just a wonderful and not... Not she's not a star the way that she ought to be in the West, but she's a star in in China. In China. Um, it has almost anime elements in the look of the demon's henchman and the way that he fights. The ending of the film is goofy and bad, frankly, but uh, all the characters are so charismatic and the situations are so strong and exciting that I don't think that's going to bother you by the time you're done with this film. You're going to be glad that you saw it. I have not yet watched the sequel. I have a copy of it here, but I hear the sequel is actually much better than the first film, so I'm looking forward to seeing Painted Skin, The Resurrection, pretty okay. soon. A uh, Korean fantasy film that I really enjoyed about a year ago. Oh, I should have made sure that I remembered the title before I said that everybody who ever loved Planescape should see it right. because it's about a pair of uh, de demon slayers one of whom dies and goes to this uh, this afterlife and finds out that maybe one of these angelic characters is the reincarnation of his dead girlfriend hard to say but then demons are attacking basically what is heaven and it's a war between the, the worlds above the middle kingdom reminds me of the name of, the, of it one of the First ones that got me interested in the Chinese dramas was the Chinese ghost story uh, That's series. That's a great movie. I love so, the first one, and the second one's pretty darn good too. Yeah, and the first one has a really scary tree monster with a very naughty tongue, yeah. a very naughty icky tongue. Yes. Yeah, so, um, another one that I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed greatly, and I, I'm sorry I will not remember the name of this. I will link to it later. But uh, Gareth Skarka, Gareth Michael Skarka of. Uh, Adam Entertainment posted these several of the Chinese television series of, yes. uh, uh, of, of some of these up with you know the idea that you get a lot from the movies and we tend to see those more here in the States than we do any of the Chinese television series sure. but he found a really great site that was hosting a lot of these legally so that you could actually uh, watch them and enjoy, enjoy them and I'll try to link, link to that on the the podcast, and maybe we'll get That's one. Of, maybe we'll get one of Dave's uh, links to one of his uh, uh, blog posts about uh, what movies they should they should follow for that. Um, another one that uh, comes to mind because we're talking about the Pathfinder novels here is that they've. I think they just recently announced this that they're going to be doing audiobooks or audio dramas based on the Pathfinder books. Is that correct? So Not on the books. Reason. The okay. first one that I'm aware of, okay. and there may be other things in the works already, is a 
a dramatic interpretation of Rise of the Rune Lords. Oh, okay. That's by the same company that does the uh, uh, the Doctor Who audio dramas. They're called Big Finish. Yeah. And I've heard a few of their productions, and they're really top quality. If well, you're a fan of old radio up. drama the way that I am, you've yeah. got to check them out. Hopefully they'll get around to doing the novels then as well. Because I'm, as everybody knows in this show, I have a problem that when I try to sit down and read a book, I feel like if I have, if I'm reading, then I have time to be writing. So I get this guilt trip that I feel like I should be doing something. And so I have found the easiest way for me is to actually sit down and listen to audiobooks. That's what I do. Most of and, my reading is actually listening while I'm on the lawn or walking the dog. Yes. So one of the things that it comes down to is recently. Um, Audible.com got a huge treasure trove, and they keep coming out with more of them of the Dungeons and Dragons uh, novels. So, which I think Black Wolf is actually in there. I'll have to go double Black check. Black Wolf and, and Lord of Stormother are both there. I have to pester someone to get some more credits for author copies. Yes. I think I got one or two credits, but they've done five or six books that I've been a part of now, and I, I yes. want to hear them. The and, narrator for Black Wolf and Lord of Stormother is a lot better than I anticipated. He's very yeah, good. The, the, the narrators have have been very well. I'm in the middle of a. Uh, and one of the big things that I'm a fan of is going back and listening to books that I've read. And I'm going back through now and listening to uh, Cormier a novel right now, which is Jeff Grubb, who uh, we've talked right. to before. And then, uh, of course, Ed Greenwood, who I'm a huge geek boy fan of, his his uh, design work for Worlds uh, especially. But uh, the Cormier uh, – but I – I'll probably pick up Black Wolf now as one of the things that because I remember having the book and having read the book and being like I like this book, but then I didn't follow on with the series because I started writing then. <laughs> yeah, so. you lose a lot of your reading time when you start to write. Yes. One more kung fu movie. I know that you didn't ask okay. for more, but you've got to uh, you've got to see The Bride with White Hair. Yes, that's yeah. whether great, whether yeah. you see the sequel or not is not as important. It's not bad. It's just not as good as the first one. The first one is brilliant. And I want to give you another one because I can't help myself. <laughs> the title will turn you off, but don't listen to the title. Go watch Deadful Melody. It is the most Wahoo D&D-oriented kung fu movie I've ever seen. You can see each of these characters as being someone in your party or the evil opponent party. Yes. So Deadful if Melody. We're, if, and it's we're not a back, if we're going to go back and talk about kung fu movements for a moment, i got to say that my, my favorite and, and my introduction to, to kung fu films is Five Deadly Venoms. That's a great film. Um, which, when when Dave had started writing uh, his novel, he got on Facebook and said, "Hey, what 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 movies do people recommend in this genre?" And I said, Five Deadly Venoms." And uh, I don't know if you'd seen it at that point or not. I don't remember. You mentioned whether you had it. Or not. It's one that I caught up on. I had seen it years before I wrote Master of Devils, but I, it's not one of the earliest ones that I saw. Yeah. Um, the great thing about Five Deadly Venoms um, is that most of the actors are are B plus level stars in Kung Fu uh -huh. cinema. So if you follow the actors, not the director, you can see this group of films that are all called films of the Venoms because one or two or sometimes three or four of those stars are in these various films and collectively they're known as the films of the Venoms. And, and in general, the storylines actually have absolutely no relation to it. The style is very, very different. Um, I'm actually reminded a little bit of uh, support your local sheriff and support your local gunslinger, right? The, the movies officially have nothing to do with each other. Right. But they are very, very, very similar with basically the same or, or overlapping cast. So if you like the one, you'll probably like the other. Yes. Yeah. Um, but when I was doing uh, the Talented Monk uh, supplement that Super Genius released for Pathfinder... I was going through, say, Five Deadly Venoms and, and one of the novels that is frequently marked as Return of the Five Deadly Venoms, even though it's not. Right. Um, and, and it's called The Crippled at, Avengers. Yes. I wrote a love letter to that movie in uh, Gareth Skarka's uh, Tales of the Far West. There you go. My story is called Crippled Avengers. The story is not exactly the same, but the basic situation, here are a bunch of people who have all been uh, crippled by villains, you know, mutilated or broken in some way, learn their new strengths after... They learn how to overcome the, the damage that he's done to them and uh, team up. Okay. Um, there was a question I had, and I'll come back to it in a second. Um, we've reached the hour mark since... Uh, wow, have we? Well, we're kind of a little over it, but we're, we're fine. It time flies. We get fast. So I will bring us to the section of the uh, podcast we call Pimp Your Product. 
Uh, this is where uh, we bring everybody on the cast to talk about specifically about their uh, product. We've been all over the place with Dave today because Dave's just been doing this a lot longer than even we have. So uh, we, we have a lot to cover, and we still would probably never cover everything we want to cover with Dave because we'd like to go back to the Dragon Magazine days and work our way through there on every little product he worked on and talk about it for a little while. <laughs> but uh, Dave, what are you here to tell us about today? Since you ask... Yes. Uh, my most recent publication is King of Chaos. It's a Pathfinder Tales novel. It's the fourth full-length novel featuring Radovan and the Count. Um, what's cool about this one is that uh, more than any other Pathfinder story before it, it's heavily related to the Wrath of the Righteous adventure path. It's 100% spoiler-free. You could read the novel first. You could play the adventure first. It doesn't matter. But they happen in the same region, and some of the events in the novel will influence events, especially in the latter half of the adventure path. So if you were to buy, say, five copies of the novel and hand them to your players, they would have a really good idea of the feeling of the setting, and they would have some non-spoilery Easter eggs to discover in the latter half of the uh, Wrath of the Righteous campaign. I can't be more specific for two reasons. One, if I could, I didn't, wouldn't want to spoil it. Two, I don't know all of the connections that are going to be there. Because after the novel was done, James Jacobs took a look at it and decided to pull out some elements and insert them into the latter half of the adventure path. So I'm dying to see the latter half of the adventure path because I want to see <laughs> how it turns out. I want to see where that thing went and what effect it has on, on the uh, AP. Okay. Are you still playing Pathfinder? I want to. I yes. keep buying the miniatures. I keep thinking next month is the month that I call the band back together. But I overbooked myself pretty horribly this year. Yeah. I've got two more obligations to fulfill. I will be done by the middle of October. And at that point, I really want to start a new novel right away. But maybe I will just stop for a week and prepare to return to gaming. We last played the Jade Regent Adventure Path. We may return to that but some of the guys I played with have since uh, gotten girlfriends, uh, geek girlfriends. So I might just invite some couples over and run Weedy Goblins to see how much the uh, the, the girlfriends enjoy gaming. I suspect well, they might awesome. enjoy it a lot. Yeah. And if they enjoy the first one, we'll do the second one. And if they enjoy both of those, we'll see where we're going to go. We'll just we'll decide at that yeah. point. But I've got all this gaming paraphernalia saved in my library. I haven't played for over a year, and it's kind of killing me. I understand. Owen? So do you, just a sec. Dave, do you okay. know what your next novel to come out is going to be? No. As a matter of fact, I don't, which is unusual since about 2009. I've always known what the next year was going to bring me. I'm taking a little, I shouldn't say a break, because I am working on stuff. Uh -huh. uh, I've been doing a lot of shorter work. Um, I, I may do another licensed novel or two um, for another publisher this coming year, but um, we haven't, I haven't signed any contracts yet. Okay. And I may write, uh, I may just write an original novel and just say, everybody leave me alone for six months. I want to do this thing. Kickstarter! See, see where that takes me. I don't think I am a big enough name to make Kickstarter work for me that way. I think you're wrong. I, I think it's more likely that I will have some success with a, with a traditional publisher on this particular okay. book. Okay. I, I, certainly a traditional publisher is a, a way to go, but I'm with Steve. I think you may be underestimating your name recognition if you think you can't. And you, well, you I appreciate that. You have level of name recognition. He got paid for 12 novels, so you right. only have to be 12th as well known as Matt Forbeck to make Kickstarter work for a novel. Another thing that I've discovered this year, uh, more than ever before, even though I've done the self-promotion thing in the past, when you've got three novels and a number of short works and Kickstarters all in the same year, the promotion time, the organization time, the convention uh -huh. time, it really sucks away your writing time. Yeah. And one of my goals for next year is to spend a little bit less time promoting and a, and a little bit more time writing. Well, that's kind of the benefit, though, of Kickstarter sometimes is you get to do that promotion early, early on. And then uh -huh. you get to spend your time producing it. Now you have to talk a little bit in your updates about what you've been right. writing. But, you know, you can give sample snippets to your backers about what, you, what you've been doing. Being True. somebody who's kickstarted a novel at a much lower level than would be expected because we used, a very, we used one of our better freelancers who... Uh, right. And, and, like I said, we struggled with it because, you know, it was fiction and that it, it's easier to promote a game on Kickstarter than it is a novel, I think. But I think you're mistaken in that because, and I, th and I recommend that everybody try it at least once, even if all you do is use a pseudonym because you don't want to 
uh, do the... We, we all know that there is still a stigma in the publisher's world about a self-done novel. I have t I've had people tell me that. I've written game tie-in novels. I've yes, got all I the do. stigma. Yes. So my point to be there is that, that even if somebody does it under a pseudonym, you can, you can still find, I think... Because I was surprised, simply for everything that we've done, to give an example from Lords of Cosmer and Shadow, half of our uh, 700 and some backers were just for people who browse Kickstarter looking for things to back. That's great. And, and it, really they, they did it based on the idea they'd never heard of Amber the Diceless role-playing game before. Mm. They had never, uh, but they loved the idea of a Diceless tabletop, and they r read the pitch, and they loved the pitch, so then they came on, and then we had the people who just showed up because it was Diceless. We had the people who showed up because it was Amber. I think you'll find out that You'll have a lot of people who will come in because they know you and they've heard about you and that, but you'll also find people who've never found your, read your stuff before. And it'll be about half because the, plat the platform of Kickstarter gives you such a huge access to people who are just looking right. to back. So, but that's, I've seen some very talented that, writers who have at least yeah. as much reputation as I have get just barely enough money to make this happen. Yeah. I think gamers... Um, have a, a much higher concentration of enthusiasm. Yeah, so probably. once you have a game product up there, I think you're automatically in a class above prose fiction on Kickstarter <laughs> for enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm so sorry. This, this is all because I, I wouldn't pimp my product, and I apologize. That's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, I've actually... I, I missed the last one of these, so I, I actually have a few weeks of product, and I, I won't go on too long because they're go all ahead. bullet points. Uh, go ahead. They're, they're one-pagers, but the, the things I want to talk about the most right at the moment are I've done two bullet points that are little bitty expansions for the uh, the Mythic rules from Mythic Adventures. Um, we did number one with a bullet point, Mythic Fighter class features, because looking at the Mythic rules, uh, it seemed to me that spell pastors kind of got to double dip, because everyone has Mythic abilities from their Mythic path, and everyone has access to Mythic feats, but spellcasters also have access to mythic spells, which means they've got access to more ways to be mythic than non-spellcasters. And it seemed to me it should not be too difficult to take the, the class features of the fighter and say, as a path pick, the same way you, you would pick a spell if you were a spellcaster, you can choose to upgrade one of your existing cat class features to be mythic. So it's got nice. mythic bravery and mythic uh, weapon training, and it, it means that you can do the things you pick the fighter class to be able to do to begin with at a mythic level if you choose to do it. Um, and I was dipping my toe in because I, you know, I, I didn't work on the mythic book, and so I'd had the, the actual final rules only for a few weeks at that point. And so one class seemed like a way to do it, and it seems very popular, and uh, I'm, I may well be tackling other mythic class features for other classes as we go forward. Mythics? And then the other one was very much literally drawn from the fact that I was sitting down with a bunch of other people trying to make mythic characters, um, and we wanted to have mythic weapons, and we didn't want them to have to be artifacts, and we didn't want them to be intelligent. And if you're doing the legendary weapons using the mythic character rules, 90% of the options require it to either be an artifact or to be an intelligent item. Um, so I put together a, an additional set of six powers specifically for legendary weapons, for mythic characters. It's about as niche a product as you can come up with. It's a set of rules for a set of rules for a set of rules for a game. Um, but if you are in that exact place where you want more options to make a legendary weapon for your mythic character, uh, I think people will find it very helpful. Okay. Um, I have found that you know third-party publishing for mythic rules seems to be very popular right now. Now that, of course, could be simply because the Mythic's rule set just came out, of course, and that always spikes popularity. And that you also have the uh, the adventure path running right now. Yep. Right now, right now for it. I have yet to touch it. We've been looking at what we're going to do with the mythic rule set for the, our our setting in the demi plane of gaming, uh, Colosseum Morphian, and what we're going to do with that. But uh, I think it's a really interesting rule set. It's a completely different take than I expected them to go when I thought about something along the lines of mythic or epic level adventuring. So I, f I find it really, really interesting, uh, the mythic set. And it's something I'm slowly looking at because I didn't get a chance, because I was so busy working on so many other projects, I didn't get a chance to look deep into the rule set, but I am now. Right. Yeah, but I, I like the way you're, go you're going and taking small steps with it uh, is really interesting. But... Um, what am I pimping this week? Oh, um, 
We just released today uh, the next in our series that we've been doing called In the Company of, and this one is In the Company of Medusa, and you get the option of playing... Which, which should have had a Death Scrunchie in it. it. Which should have had a Death Scrunchie in it. If I could have, I would have had a Death Scrunchie in it. But um, for the, uh, the the demi plane for the demi plane of ga gaming, I'll talk a little bit about what it what the series is. One, it's about taking monsters and making them playable classes, so that you can, you know, we have giants, we have uh, minotaurs that we've done, uh, we've done gargoyles. As the idea that you advance as a class as a racial paragon yeah. class and start out as a low level monster and advance all the way up to being a really high-level monster. And uh, with the Medusa, you know, you want to talk about two main things. You can have the Medusa base class. You can still just be a, a low-level Medusa as just a race and still run around with, you know, being a sorceress and whatever. So some of your abilities don't work as powerful as they would if you were a true Medusa, such as your petrification gaze is not as powerful and so forth, and how you balance that out with, versus, you know, the idea that petrification really can't be cured until until about uh, 11th level. So my idea was to just make petrification have a duration rather than normally being permanent. That was one of our workarounds. But without getting into too much other game mechanics, you the class itself comes back to the idea that you have the Medusa's hair, which I wanted to do a lot with, and I do a little bit of what, to, to get back to what uh, Dave was talking about, it has a little bit of the White Witch in it. The idea that she can use her Medusa's hair, it's a bit more like the Medusa from uh, Marvel, 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 Comics. Marvel, Marvel Comics with the idea of what she can do with her snake hair and have some fun with that. Um, it also comes back to what you can do with your petrification gaze beyond just turning people into stone. Uh, and then we come back to the idea of uh, something that Owen's been doing a lot of, which is talented-based classes. The idea that um, I, I decided to get, to go through all the ideas of what a, an advanced Medusa, you know, somebody who was really powerful, uh, uh -huh. could do, and started writing down all the ideas of of what it could do with Liz Smith, who was the author and coming back in and doing some additional design over her design so that we could get this really deep set of talents that you could choose from and so that each Medusa would be its own custom thing rather than just one straight classes. We had that benefit with giants because there were so many different types of giants that right. you could be. Um, and you had that benefit with minotaurs because minotaurs can be, you know, either hunters or you can get them ideas, defenders of the maze, or they had certain basis uh, for that. And uh, one of the nice things that Liz touched on was the idea of the three that there are three Medusae, uh, re originally referred to as Gorgons, uh, and how you would talk on Sethano and Ariel and beyond Medusa. And we touch a little bit on that, but uh, I had a great in influence from Owen, as I always do, do on that design uh, when I came back to it, because I wanted to give all of these options. And then we stole something from uh, Sean K. Reynolds using the OGL. He had done a the treasure troves for Silver Throne games where he had done a half Medusa monster template, so we th we we converted that and updated it to Pathfinder and threw that in the back half of our book. And, and that actually is the end plate of our book. But of course we credit that in the OGL. Right. Sure. But that was something that I felt was really appropriate for the, the book. So and then it I comes from Sean K. Reynolds makes it nicer because people accept it more. <laughs> I think I also had a half Medusa in uh, Bastards of Bloodlands for underneath. As I recall. I'm sure you probably did. I probably just missed that <laughs> one. So. Well, you've, you've, you've clearly looked at the book, right? So I, I've clearly looked at that book. You know, I did, what, Weird, Lurkers. Uh, I, I'm working on Wretches and Blinklings now. So th th those are, But those are going to be in the Quest Haven book rather than okay. getting out as their own standalone stuff. Though they might get standalone status first. Who knows? But... Uh, I've had some real good response to the book so far, so I've been very ha very happy. But everybody wanted me to have a Death Scrunchie in there. For those who don't know what a Death Scrunchie is, uh, there is actually a Medusa character in Marvel comic books that appears in The Incredible Hercules, which is the funniest comic book you will ever get to read uh, that takes itself semi-seriously. And one of the things it has is that it has a Gorgon, and she gets very upset one day, and of course she takes her snake hair back and puts on a scrunchie, but because she's in a very pissed off mood, she pulls out a death scrunchie out of her drawer of scrunchies. And just the way that uh, Greg writes that series is uh, really comedy and uh, how he po points things out and says, death scrunchie! And then 
they come to a picture of her face after she's put it on. Expression worthy of death scrunchie. And so it's a very, very big thing for Medusa for us. So we've had a good time with that. Um, I think that's all I've got to pimp today, of course. Uh, that's the, the big stuff that we've done. Of course, we did uh, the 20 variant foes. Uh, but I talked about that last week, so I'll skip that. So I want to thank Dave Gross for joining us here on the Demi Plane of Gaming. Thanks and for having me. <laughs> and I am, of course, your host, Stephen D. Russell. I'm, of course, here with our eminent co-host, Owen Casey Stevens. And we will have a very good day, folks, and thank you for joining us.